Thank you, Acting Speaker. Um, I rise to speak on the um, Human Tissue Amendment Bill 2020, and um, uh, I'll just give a brief overview of what the bill does. Uh, thank you to the um, Health Minister for the explanation of the amendments which we've just been um, given notice of uh, in the last 24 hours. But this bill basically amends the Human Tissue Act of 1982 to include a process for the authorisation of any anti-mortem procedures which are required to be undertaken in relation to a person when the removal of their tissue has been authorised for the purpose specified in the Human Tissue Act. Basically, this is a bill about making sure that the procedures are in place um, when a person is past the stage of life but has not reached, reached post-mortem, which is death. Um, so the term anti-mortem means usually when someone's often actually on life support and um, death is, is imminent. And um, so the reason for this, uh, there was some ambiguities left as a result of the Medical Treatment Planning and Decisions Acts of 2016, which was repealed um, for the Medical Treatment Act of 1998 um, and left some ambiguities, like I say, around some terminology in making sure uh, that there was authorisation for procedures to take place in that period between life and uh, post-mortem or death. Um, so the bill, uh, which is, the, so the amendment to the Act of the Human Tissue Act of 1982 created that, um, created that anomaly. Um, so this bill will now um, create a, a legal framework for permitting anti-mortem um, procedures. Now, many of those procedures are things like taking blood, um, being on a life support machine, such as, and so maintaining life um, support, such as uh, ventilation is the usual um, thing that you see. Um, giving someone medications, that's often to maintain um, hemostasis, which means you know, that you don't want the blood pressure to be really high and cause uh, damage to some of the organs that you may want to use if the person has authorised that uh, use. Um, taking blood to get some uh, understanding of the, you know, it's normal stuff that, that goes on every day. Or um, things like medical imaging, such as um, x-rays, CAT scans, or also known as CT scans, or MRIs, and many of those um, procedures that will be taking place uh, to prepare for um, some of those organ donations. So this bill outlines that these can only occur once two registered medical practitioners have certified in writing that an individual's respiration or circulation of blood is being maintained only by artificial means. In other words, they are not able to live um, because they've only got artificial support that keeps their brain from um, not completely becoming um, uh, di dying or their circulation being able to be maintained. Circulatory death is what it's known as. Um, so the medical uh, treatment decision maker must also be appointed if they... Um, the next of kin can't be um, contacted. So this is putting procedures uh, around uh, the process that needs to take place to make sure there is proper authorisation and management of the patient. Um, and you know, I see we've got an amendment today and the minister at the, at the table has been so kind as to give some overview of that. But it, it does make me concerned that an amendment to such an important bill that's had this anomaly and ambiguity around it for some time has taken till the 11th hour and it was just yesterday morning that we were notified of the amendments and the amendments actually are around making sure that the ambiguity that they're trying to address is less ambiguous. So, in other words, the bill wasn't adequate. And, um, you know, if you're trying to address an ambiguity, and today we've got amendments to strengthen the fact that there's still the ambiguity there, you've got to ask yourself, where is the government? What are they doing where they've got something as important as this? And the respect of a patient, the respect of uh, the, um, you know, the family uh, is what this is all about. Yet it still hadn't been uh, cleared up or addressed properly. But I... Uh, it, you know, we've, we've seen many examples of the way this government, A, doesn't consult well enough. Um, just, you know, a few months ago, we saw bills that were coming in that there was no period of consultation available. Um, 
it's like I don't get the opportunity as the uh, Member of Parliament to go back to my community and consult. Some bills are introduced on a Tuesday and then we're addressing them and passing them on a, on a Thursday. So it's like there's no understanding. And we also see, um, you know, um, muck-ups like this or constantly. I mean, some of the things we're seeing with the um, pandemic. I know a pandemic is a difficult time, but at the same time, uh, the ambiguity, the challenges that we're seeing um, for people whose businesses are so disadvantaged by some decisions. And then when I write to the minister to say, could you consider this because it's an anomaly to my region, I don't get anything back for six weeks. And, you know, just this morning I had um, Jason Lamb from Jason Lamb Swim School ring me. And um, we all know that indoor pools are open, um, able to be open in the next short while or they are in the regions now. And um, Jason said, you know, I've got a swim school on a school ground Theoretically, I rented off the school. It's on public land. It's got its own driveway in, its own driveway out. None of the children on the school go near it. Um, so, you know, I'm going to lose all my customers because they're going to go off to other businesses. So how is it fair? So I hope um, I'll write to James Molino, the Minister for Education, but I'll also bring it up with the Minister at the table now to consider some of these anomalies. And please don't um, make us wait six weeks when businesses are actually compromised the way this young uh, man, Jason Lamb, is compromised. And, you know, he's been running a swim school for 20 years. So for him not to be able to do that, when it actually makes no sense, and I get that we must minimise movement and we must have um, restrictions in place, but all those things will be able to be maintained in this the instance. Member for Tane. Thank you, Acting Speaker. Uh, just on a point of order, um, could you bring the member back to the substance of the bill? I'm not too sure why she's talking about swim schools when this is a bill very much about human tissue and organ donation. Thank the member. I do accept that on first when people are first speaking on bills, that there can be a wide-ranging debate. However, I do agree with the member that this has strayed way off the cent, any, anything to do with the bill whatsoever. So I would ask the member to go back, please. We'll come back to the bill, but that was actually about the ambiguities and the anomalies that are existing and how challenging it is for the community when the government doesn't actually make things clear when they've had the opportunity. And um, this bill presents today to make some very important changes to the, um, the, the uh, human tissue Act, but um, has left ambiguity, which the government are only addressing today. So it was on that point that I was referring to the Jason Lamb Swim School, and I thank the Minister uh, for listening, and um, I will make sure I send you an email about it. Um, so, um, so we have the, a bill here that, um, again, um, has been uh, out for discussion for some time, but it's only today we have the Law Institute um, mentioned about their worry that the bill still doesn't um, fix the ambiguity and uh, Donate Life as well, who brought uh, to the Minister's attention their concern, uh, writing as clinicians on behalf of the organisation Donate Life to uh, strengthen that up. Look, in my experience, um, uh, when I've had ventilator patients who are um, donors who have actually signed the form whilst they've been um, on their licence to um, say they want to donate organs, which uh, I encourage people to do. Um, you know, I want to reassure or take this opportunity that in my experience um, there is quite a strong oversight and the responsibility is taken very, very seriously by the medical community and it is only very senior medical professionals who uh, do the um, very extensive tests that take place when a patient um, is in that uh, position where they, their life is um, over and um, the only reason they are alive is because they're usually maintained, um, they're having their circulation maintained and their brain uh, oxygenated via um, circulation support. So it's very distressing time for the family. The patient usually looks well. They're um, very well cared for by the staff in that they're sleeping, they've got a ventilator, they look like they're just laying there. And so it's very, very difficult for families to actually accept that death has um, really occurred. But I've only ever seen a, a very, very um, huge responsibility taken on by the medical profession to be very cognizant of the family and the next of kin and also very, very respective of the patient, um, whether they're in, you know, anti-mortem anti phase or even 
um, post-mortem phase. And one of the um, concerns that was raised by the Catholic Healthcare uh, when we were consulting on this uh, bill was that the, um, there would be a loss of respect for the patient during that anti-mortem phase, and they wanted to be reassured that this bill wouldn't compromise that. You know, and it, again, in my experience, I remember actually laying out my first patient um, back uh, when I first started in my nursing role, and it was the actual, it was the grandfather of one of my um, nursing colleagues who's still my very best friend today. So um, her grandfather, you know, we nursed and he passed away, and when I was um, doing the procedures that you do after death um, on the person, you're very, very respectful of the fact that they have um, lived and passed and their family are very grieving. And so I've never seen, and I'm pretty confident, um, you know, the community can be reassured that the health community uh, are very respectful. So, but I think it's important that um, that has been raised with the, um, with the Shadow Health Minister and we're uh, confident that there are safeguards in place that do respect that period and that these tests can be taken and um, uh, organ donations can take place um, in a respectful way of both the recipient and of the patient who's passed away and the patient's family. I will just make mention here um, about a lady in my electorate called um, Anne Ray. So Anne has been campaigning for, oh, it must be close on 30 years, for uh, people to consider organ donation. And what an extraordinary activity for this woman to do. She goes to all the, um, you know, the country shows and she has a stand and she'll sit there and she'll just be able to make available information. Because it is hard when you're alive to think about the fact that A, you might die and B, do you want to give up your organs? But you know, I'm, I'm someone who's quite confident to do that and quite, um, quite comfortable in doing that um, because I do know that the procedures are absolutely robust in um, making sure the patient, whilst, as I say, they may be on a ventilator and look like they're breathing, um, are actually not um, actually alive any longer. So I really want to... Um, uh, congratulate the work Anne's done over the years. And um, I think it's really important, though, we as a society do remember that it is a person's right to donate, not necessarily uh, we should be saying everybody must do it. So it shouldn't ever be an opt-out system, in my view. It should be an opt-in system. So that, um, But we should actually get uh, more discussion around the importance of whether it's just... You know, someone's sclera, which is your eyes, that can be um, transforming somebody else's uh, vision, or whether it be kidneys or lungs or hearts or so many things that we can give today. Even skin, um, there are so many um, things that we can do. And, and if we get our heads more around that death is part of life instead of something to be frightened of, I think we as a society will be better at moving from the 80s, where we first started doing this, to the 2020 now, where that's um, quite a... Uh, a well accepted and well understood procedure. Um, so I do support the bill with the amendment. I am com comfortable that uh, there is enough safeguards in place, but it does give me the opportunity to um, to thank, like we had thank you day last uh, Friday, which was actually supposed to be grand final day, um, and we didn't have the grand final in Victoria because of the government's contact tracing and hotel quarantine stuff-ups that made uh, Victoria stand out as the, um, the state that wasn't achieving what could have been achieved, what other states have achieved with this pandemic happening at the moment. So we lost the um, grand final and um, now we had thank you day for our nurses and doctors and support staff of the health community, which is a great thing to say, thank you. I mean, I certainly know how brilliant the health staff, the, the cleaners, the orderlies, the doctors, the um, support staff in allied health, occupational therapists, et cetera, et cetera, work because uh, I was part of that system for a very long time. So um, I look at what my community in Warrnambool achieved, the um, Warrnambool Base Hospital, under extraordinary circumstances, getting ready for COVID. They turned the um, intensive care, they had two intensive care sites ready, one we called the dirty COVID area and one the clean area. They've got a medical terms for, you know, Oh, infection control, and I could probably go on there for a while about understanding infection control um, and having 
adjacent understanding, which Warrnambool West Hospital and other hospitals in my region all did, unlike the government who got um, untrained people in to try and manage an infection uh, control situation in the middle of an outbreak of a pandemic. I'll never get my head around that. And I absolutely know we would not have done that. We would have taken the offer of the uh, Australian Defence Force and we would never have compromised the Victorians the way this current government has compromised them. So. Um, so I want to thank the, particularly the staff at Warrnambool Base Hospital. This is a group of people who have been quietly getting on with the job of trying to um, work under extraordinary conditions because for a number of years now, uh, the Liberal National Government have promised that the second stage of the hospital would be delivered. And um, for the last five budgets, um, we've been waiting for commitment from the Andrews Labor Government and the Minister's at the table. So we've got a budget coming down, hopefully, I think, is it November 10th? Can't possibly tell me the date of the. <laughs> so when we get the privilege of knowing what date we will be hearing the budget, which has been rumoured to be November 10th and has to be by the end of November, I think uh, Mr. Andrews of the Premier has said. So when we hear that privilege, I'm hoping that the Minister for Health will give me the good news that Warnell Base Hospital's second stage will be funded because this is a development that is not wanted. It is needed. And it's not just something for good looks or for, you know, happiness and whatever. It's about the fact that the accident emergencies area specifically is extremely compromised in space, which puts it very, very difficult if you've got, say, a big motor car accident, which we often get, and you've got three or four people in critical positions, that they actually can't get the MRI machine in, or not the MRI, but the X-ray machine in, and they can't um, do blood gases, and they can't do all the sorts of things like intubate at the same time as you're trying to X-ray um, to try and save a life. And these guys actually do an extraordinary job uh, under those circumstances. Also, the accident, uh, the theatres. The theatres are, are absolutely um, needing to be upgraded. Uh, it's not meeting the needs of the d population demand. We've got, and what happens in in health is you don't just stop and say you can't strike like the unions would encourage you to do because you've actually got patients. And and unfortunately, the government's playing on that. Um, on that desire of, you know, you can't fail. As, as a nurse, as a, as a doctor, you just can't fail because somebody actually suffers, dies in pain, whatever. There's consequences that are way too hard for your, um, your ethics to allow. So we've got uh, surgeons working uh, after hours, you doing um, procedures like um, uh, minor procedures such as um, lacer lacerations, um, you know, after nine o'clock at night because the theatres aren't free. And that's actually not within the guidelines of ideal, but it's to make sure that they actually get through the workload. So we've got really, really compromised. And if you talk to the, um, the theatre staff, they actually are really compromised in their... Um, in their well-being, because it is it is really difficult circumstances. So, I know there's a big health fund. You, you know that COVID, we've got to get on and get some jobs done to get the economy back up and running. And here's a shovel-ready project, the Warnell Base Hospital, that needs to be um, funded in the budget. And I implore you, Minister, to please. We've waited over five years. We've promised every every time. You know, Dennis Napthine put the money there. Um, Matthew Guy promised it. You know, I've committed to it. It's not something, as I say that you know would be lovely it's actually something that is going to compromise the health and well-being of our community and uh, I'm sure you don't want to see that any more than uh, I want to see that so I look forward to the good news and while we're on it don't forget because you've just come from the uh, mental health portfolio the lookout project as well a very important project that uh, funds mental uh, sorry um, drug and alcohol rehabilitation beds and you know I don't know how many times when I was in my role working in um, in, in um, a health, community health setting that I would make calls looking for beds for patients who had done the two week um, in hospital time to, um, to detox because you don't want a patient detoxing out of the hospital setting because they can actually fit and have cardiac arrests, et cetera, et cetera. So that's fine, we can get to that stage. But then to let them out into the community to go back to that environment which was actually uh, difficult for them to maintain that uh, stay off drugs position, um, I was looking constantly for beds all over the state. And a lot of my patients at the time um, were very, very committed to their area. You know, whether they had young children or whether they had Indigenous um, uh, links that, you know, the supporting families in Indigenous communities is in, in incredible, something that I will always admire and always um, you know, always take away as a mother that, gee, they're fantastic at family and often I'd go to work and my little girl would be homesick and 
Violet Clark, who I pay my respects to, passed away just earlier this year, um, would say to me, Roma, what are you doing at work? Get home to your daughter. So I'd often take her and they were just the most amazing uh, group of people who supported families. So for them to go away to find a rehab bed wasn't an acceptable situation and we didn't have rehab beds for the post detox period. So it's incredibly important to our Indigenous community, our, um, our people who understand that this is not something people want to do. They don't get stuck on drugs and, and fall into that situation. They actually want help. These are people ready to actually make the move into getting back into a healthy phase. So two projects that are very important. Um, but yes, again, a big thank you to the nurses and doctors and all the work that was done during the pandemic. Um, we in Warrnambool <laughs> and the southwest coast had uh, four outbreaks, really. And I'd like to take a minute to remember that um, co co um, communities like Portland, Haywood, Port Ferry all did such a good job because we actually really know how to uh, look out for each other. And I suppose it's because we've got smaller areas and we do know each other well. Um, so contact tracing wasn't something we sat back and waited for the government to do. There was a lot of evidence at that point that the government weren't doing it very capably, and that's proven to be fact, not fiction. So, you know, I, I take my hat off to the work that Portland District Health did to um, set up extra testing sites, to um, use social media, to be open and honest with the community of where the outbreaks um, occurred, which businesses were um, people went to, or um, you know, they just used what I see. What I see New South Wales do. Um, Premier Gladys Berejiklian is doing exactly the same thing. She's being very open with her community. And that's the stark difference I'm seeing between the Victorian government and their inability to really speak to the people around how can you be part of our solution. It feels more like we've been blamed as a community, whether it be people in the home's fault or the young people's fault or, you know, there's always someone's fault, instead of actually working with the community like we saw in South West Coast. You know, the Warrnambool community, we saw the business midfield meets outstanding um, response in they ignored the DHHS uh, recommendation who said they could stay open and shut down. And we also ignored as a community that you can't get a test unless you're asymptomatic, uh, unless you're symptomatic. They tested uh, all the workers at Midfield Meads and waited till all the results came back before they opened up the business. And so business, community and health service locally working together is the epitome of how we should be using um, the community and, and addressing this pandemic. Because as I'm hearing admitted around this room today even, um, we're going to have to live with this pandemic now and that's how you live with it in the country, as I'm sure Mr McCurdy at the table, um, member for... Um, Ovens Valley would actually agree with because you've seen the same thing in your community, how well uh, we work together. So, you know, we've certainly had restrictions eased. I think we will have more outbreaks. So let's just be sensible, like we've seen evidenced in the country. And if, there, if you needed an example, look at Colac, look at Shepparton, look at uh, Portland where outbreaks occurred, and they didn't become explosive situations. They were well-managed clusters. So... Um, yeah. Um, the other thing I think we need to think about is locally how well we can do things is just recently in the government have actually just recently announced that the there's some funding for the logistics um, hub at the hospital to be moved off site. So the linen um, area and supply department to be moved off site. And that's uh, a really big um, win for the local area because it's many, many jobs. And it's I think testament to the likes of people like Terry Hoy. Terry Hoy's um, been in the supply department down at Warrnambool for years. I used to work with Terry when I would get supplies for the community health service and he was amazingly um, resourceful and um, effective. And uh, so, you know, it's fantastic to see people like Terry who have done such a great job because having these top-down approaches and we could have centralised this and it's great, I'm really pleased they haven't because the, um, the locals know how to do it and they know the needs of their region. So, you know, when we've got, um, comp, you know, situations where we need a hospital, like in this situation, we're now going to move the um, supply department offside. I hope that is an indication that the government is ready to fund the next stage because they know stage two of the hospital um, needs to be done. 
Um, obviously, elective surgeries are going to be a massive issue uh, right across the state. So, you know, post-pandemic, there's never been a more important time to fund health and to recognise the importance of health because everyone's got it at top of mind. So the government, I think, understands that. But, um, you know, we're not going to get on top of elective surgery um, um, lists at Warrnambool, for example, unless we actually do get that redevelopment. Um, that probably leads me close to the end of the bill, so I will just wrap up by saying this is a, an important bill because I think um, leaving an ambiguity like uh, the that was left in the bill after the change and then to see an amendment come in today is nothing short of disappointing because, you know, such an important bill, you would hope the government who's trying to fix up an ambiguity, which is why we're here, and then comes up saying that the, um, the Law Institute and the like actually think there's still an ambiguity in the bill. So we've had to see an amendment come before the um, parliament just within 24 hours is, is a rushed and um, poor, poor uh, form on behalf of the government. But as I've said all through this, um, the health department, um, minister, the health minister has shown quite clearly that she wasn't across um, health like we'd hoped. Uh, the pandemic response has demonstrated that and we can only hope that they've got, you know, nine months now, we hope that contact tracing is finally fixed. Um, certainly learned their lesson about uh, hotel quarantine and using um, untrained uh, in health and, and infection control people was the disaster decision that led to the quarantine, a hotel quarantine mess that let the virus escape and unfortunately for the 800 people who are suffering today because of the loss prematurely of a family member, uh, there is no coming back from that. There is just no way that's acceptable. Um, so as I say, to have an ambiguity in a, in a very simple bill still being ambiguous 24 hours before the bill when there's been an enormous amount of time to consult and you've got the likes of uh, Donate Life clinicians writing to the government saying, I think you better strengthen this up because it's still quite ambiguous. But in the same sense, um, donating organs, I think is a very important thing that people can do if they choose to. It should always be patient's choice and, and person's right. Um, it does give life to many people who are struggling, um, you know, someone who's on a um, dialysis machine for many hours of the week, um, really appreciate the fact that they can um, have a new life. And I've seen that so many times over. In fact, there was a woman, this was a sad story. I had a woman, sorry, a man write to me, um, just recently um, saying, please, you know, can you help me because um, I'm stuck here in Victoria because of the um, mismanagement of the government and my uh, mother has just been diagnosed with cancer and she's in Queensland and the borders are shut, which is the fault of the Victorian government because we're the only ones with, um, you know, our borders open but everyone not letting us in. Um, so he wanted to go and see his grandmother and he said the reason, sorry, he wanted to see his mother and only two years earlier she had donated a kidney to his son. So I felt so incredibly sad for this young man who, you know, his mum had given his son life and freedom and a future and here was he not able to go to Queensland to support her in her greatest time of need having just been diagnosed with uh, terminal cancer. So there's some of the horrendous stories that uh, we're seeing come out of this... Um, pandemic and I'm, I'm pretty sick to be honest hearing it called a, um, a an enemy and you know it, it, it's terrible overseas no I, I think come on let's let's work out we can we can do things like we restrictions in place we can manage to live with the virus we're going to have to because we haven't got a vaccine and if we just look across the border as I've said already to New South Wales um, they are being open with their community they are they are managing the outbreaks like we've done in the regions because they're they're honest and they're clear and they're not you know, they're not, um, I suppose they're not trying to cover up. You know, when they had the um, Ruby Princess, they came out and they said, woof, we made a mistake and uh, we've, we've, you know, Gladys Berejiklian and the Premier said, I'm sorry. We haven't seen that same level of dignity or respect for um, our community of Victoria from our Premier, unfortunately. And, you know, all we've seen is politics played, even though that's the card he keeps trying to throw at us. But as our, um, my uh, leader, Michael O'Brien, said here in the Parliament yesterday, um, we haven't had or it might have been out in, 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 at the press, we haven't had the respect of those, um, 
those discussions. You would hope we'd all come together and we'd all work together. We hope for that, but I, I haven't had any briefings and I've asked for many uh, from the Health Minister. Um, we haven't, the, we didn't know anything about the state of emergency being ex, um, expanded, which is what I said about this before, extended. Um, no consultation, which we've seen again with this bill, obviously not enough consultation if 24 hours before the bill comes to the table, you've got um, the um, organisations like the Law Institute saying um, we probably should strengthen this bill up. I mean, where was the consultation? But anyway, I'm um, probably just needing to conclude on the fact that uh, this bill I do support. I'm disappointed that there's ambiguities that had to be strengthened today, given it's a bill about strengthening ambiguities, but you know we've seen that from the government for the last nine months. I do hope they've got contact tracing right. We've got businesses and families and children who go to school right from prep through to year 12, uh, university students, people who want to get on, um, on with life and, and buy a house or get their licence, all relying on this government not making the same mistakes continuously again. We've seen enough of it. We're nine months in now and uh, you know get contact tracing fixed and do the job that the Victorian community expect so we can learn to live with this virus and I'll leave it at that.